personally, I think Brother Anthony is like a cold, cold worm that um, uh, everybody looks up to. Um, and I have never met him before, but I always met through emails and also books. Um, so it is my privilege um, and just a special moment <laughs> to really meet him. Um, and um, as you know, uh, today's lecture celebrates the publication of our very first book, uh, Disturbing Korea at the Start of the 20th Century, which I believe that uh, you have received on your way in. Um, and as the editor of this new book, Brother Anthony will present today's lecture. So you don't really have to read the whole book, but you will get a very uh, exciting, inspiring uh, lecture. Um, so I think uh, we are in for a trip today. But before we begin, I would like to briefly introduce Brother Anthony. Uh, Brother, Brother Anthony of Haiden uh, is currently the president of the Royal Asiatic Society Korea branch. He was born in England in 1942 and studied medieval and modern language at the University of Oxford um, from 1960 to 1969. Uh, he's a member of the community of Haiden, France, and has been living in Korea since 1980. Uh, he taught medieval and Renaissance English literature uh, in the English department of Sogang University, uh, located in Seoul, where he twice served as department chair. He is now an emeritus professor of Sogang University. He is also a chair professor at Hanji <coughs> University. He was president of the Medieval and Early Modern English Studies Association of Korea from 1998 until 2000. He has published nearly 30 volumes of English translation of modern Korean literature, uh, mostly poetry. Uh, he has also published <laughs> Korean Way of Tea and Korean Tea Classic. Uh, and also he is a naturalized Korean citizen, so his name is An Sun Jae. Uh, so I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. An Sun Jae. <coughs> Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. And uh, my lecture is going to be illustrated by a lot of slides, so I can encourage you to sit so that you can see the screen comfortably. I would like to start by expressing the thanks of the Royal Asiatic Society for the branch to the Academy of Korean Studies for their work, for their decision to publish uh, this uh, book containing 15 papers from our early transactions. Uh, when the uh, suggestion appeared suddenly uh, toward the end of last year, uh, I was very surprised that people would find it worthwhile uh, delving into transactions in this way and making them available. And not only this book, because the AKS is also funding the digitalizing of the entire series of transactions, as well as some other important series of periodicals from this very early period. That's very important because it gives uh, access to the early record. Uh, of Westerners who came and lived in Korea and who discovered Korea at a time when already Korea was changing a lot. My talk, I'm not sure if it's a lecture, my talk is going to try to indicate who some of these uh, early foreigners were and how they established the RASKB and uh, what was the uh, historical context for it. So uh, I begin by saying that the choice facing Korea as near the end of the 19th century was a very stark one, a choice between the old and the new. Uh, Japan had already come in early in 1876 with the Treaty of Kama, and uh, Japan was embarked clearly on the major reforms. The question, of course, was uh, should Chosa follow those reforms and change the new sometimes called enlightenment or modernization or westernization, obviously required radical change. But change was not welcome to the conservative new Confucianist stage who wielded power in Chosen. <coughs> Rather for them it meant betrayal of sacred teachings. And 
perhaps the most obvious outward change at the early time, in the early 1880s, was a presence on the Korean Peninsula of both diplomatic and military representations from outside powers, both China and Japan, especially after 1882, the troubles of 1882, had military personnel stationed in Seoul, the United States, Britain, France, Germany, Italy, and other countries and began at this period to have diplomatic representation. There were Protestant missionaries, of whom we'll be talking a lot, who were eager to transform Korea also, in many ways, not only religions. Now, once the new begins to take over, the old is very often soon abolished or at least it's transformed, either into an object of scorn and rejection, or of nostalgia, of curiosity, or of study. And the RASKB, of course, uh, represents that last option, to see the old as it disappears, as something worth studying. Now, the background, the historic background to the foundation of the RASKB uh, can be summarized by a few uh, major events of Korean history at this time in the last 20 years of the 19th century. In December 1884, there was the failed Gachin coup made by pro progressives, Korean progressives, with especially Japanese support, a very messy, uh, very bloody uh, moment. <coughs> and then, uh, 10 years later, from February to November 1894, the Donghak Rebellion, where both China and Japan sent in additional <coughs> troops competing for control over Korea already, and that led to the first Sino-Japanese War in late in July of 1894, which ended then in 1895, when the tribute relationship with China was uh, finally <coughs> abolished. And then between August 1895 and February 1896, especially, and going on, the modernizing GAP or the reforms were implemented and well-known event, October 1895, the Queen was assassinated by a band of Japanese. The people I'm going to be talking about, actually, these missionaries, these early missionaries, most of them formed a group who, after the assassination of the Queen, regularly slept in a room very close to uh, the room occupied by the King. The King was terrified uh, that he too might be killed. And particularly, he was afraid he might be poisoned, so that uh, especially Mrs. Underwood uh, was the person preparing a lot of his meals. So that these people were at the very heart of Korean history at that time. Then, as everybody knows, the king finally moved to the Russian legation and then to what's now possible. And in 1897, just before the founding of the RAS, the Dehan Empire was proclaimed. King Kuo-chong became known as the Emperor Kwang Mu. These two pictures somehow symbolize this transformation. Uh, on the left, uh, King Kuo-chong is uh, dressed in the old style. I think he's still wearing his top knot. Uh, the surroundings are all traditional Korean surroundings. And on the right, as Emperor Kwang Mu Tehan, he has modernized radically. Um, uh, the palace, well, the, the mansion at the back of uh, Gyeongbokgung, where the Queen's murder happened. Uh, you can just see at the back, behind, above the roof line, the Western style, modern uh, building, mansion, which had been put there by Saladin, the Russian architect, in 1890. Uh, even within the palace, you had this combination of the old and the new, the traditional and the Western. And so the Royal Asiatic Society, Korea branch, was essentially born at 4.30 p.m. on June the 16th, very near this today, today's date, in 1900, in the reading room of the Seoul Union Club. Seoul Union Club was a meeting place for both missionaries and diplomats, as well as businessmen. At a meeting attended by 17 men, nowhere. <coughs> And all but four of those men were missionaries. And the declared purpose of this newly established RES <coughs> was to investigate the arts, history, literature, and customs of Korea and the neighboring countries. 
those present at that meeting included the acting British charge of affair, uh, Dubbins, and the missionaries Horace Underwood, Henry Appenzeller, James Gale, Homer Holbert, George Heber Jones, and William Scranton. A few other active members of the early ISPB who were not present include Horace Allen and Mark Crawler. And at the end of the meeting, after they had agreed to establish this RESKB, uh, Mr. Gubbins uh, was elected to be the first president. Why RAS? What's this royal? The Royal Asiatic Society of Great Britain and Ireland was founded in London in 1823 and had become the model for academic societies of learned expatriates uh, across the world, especially in Asia. You could find, by this time, uh, branches of the RAS in places like Bombay, Bombay Calcutta, Hong Kong, Shanghai, uh, Singapore, and in Tokyo. But they were not allowed to use the word royal. So still today, you have the Asiatic Society of Japan, which is, in fact, uh, derived from the same inspiration. Learned societies where people meet to present papers and discuss in depth uh, their understanding of the history and culture of the country in which they have come to live. And because it's a learned society, uh, from the very beginning they published their papers. And Transactions then, the first volume of Transactions, uh, I did not bring a copy, I have several copies, but volume one is dated 1900, Volume 2 then covered 1901, and Volume 3 was published at the end of 1902. But then, for some reason, it's not quite clear why, the RSPB ceased to exist. After 1902, no officers were elected, no meetings were held, and it seemed to have died. So here's John Harrington Dubbins. He was uh, actually born in the colonial service. His father was judged to the Supreme Court in Agra in India. It's a very sad story. His father fell ill, came back to England, and in fact committed suicide when uh, John Harrington Dubbins was still only a teenager, quite a young boy. So he couldn't go to university. Instead, he became an interpreter in the British Japan Consular Service. And this is a pattern that we're going to find, that the diplomats involved in the RAS's life, with very few exceptions, were, first of all, diplomats who had lived in and learned everything about Japan. So he was Second Secretary of Tokyo. But then, while the actual act, while the actual charge of affair in Korea was away, he came to Korea from May 1900 until November 1901. And that was when he probably suggested uh, the idea of creating a branch of the RAS, because we know that he was active in the Asiatic Society in Japan. So uh, probably it was his inspiration, because there were very few British people involved in the foundation. And this is a specifically British institution. After he retired, he went back to England, and for a brief time, he was lecturing in Japanese language at Oxford University. Again, sad story, he didn't have any students. Mm -hmm. uh, the students at Oxford saw no reason why they should study Japanese, so he was kicked out. But he did write a book, he published a book about Japan at Oxford. Actually, the person he was replacing in those uh, one or two years was uh, a very remarkable diplomat, uh, John Neil Jordan, who um, was born uh, Frank was very interested in him. He was born, grew up, and studied, and began to work even in Ireland. But then, already in 1876, he joined the Chinese Consular Service. He went to work and uh, in uh, Peking. He was Chinese secretary, so he was already perfectly proficient in Chinese. And then, 1896, he was appointed Consul General, British Consul General in Seoul. He became Treasury Affair and Minister Resident as the position was upgraded. But then, from 1906, his really important position was, for all these years, for 14 years, he was Her Majesty's, His Majesty's, Envoy Extraordinary and Minister of Planning the Venture to China. And, in fact, he was, as such, appointed to the Privy Council. 
so a very important person. But he wasn't interested in the RAS, I'm sure. So among the founders of the RAS, uh, we have to count these missionaries. The first figure, Henry Gerard Appenzeller, uh, he was the first Methodist missionary to reach Korea. He and Horace Underwood, in fact, arrived on the same boat in Korea in 1885, just after Gatchin Kool. He thought that Korea needed change, and he thought that the change should involve education, democracy, and Christianity. He was not particularly interested in traditional Korean culture. He was very dynamic, and it was Appenzeller who established the first Western-style school, the Peche Hakdam, and then he saw the need for books to be published, so he founded in 1890 the Trilingual Press. Trilingual because books had to be produced in English and in Hangul and in Hanul and Chinese. And that press was the press which produced the first issues of transactions. Appen Center also did many other things, founded Bible Society, Literature Society, the Soul Union Club, where the IS was born. And at this time, most of these people that I'm going to mention were involved in translating the Bible into Korea. Tragically, Appen Center died. In June 1902, he was on a boat headed for Mokpo, when that boat, a Japanese boat, now collided with another boat from the same line, it's very strange how two boats can meet like that in the dark, in a rather foggy night. And the boat that he was on sank in two or three minutes. And um, so uh, he was lost. Actually, Appenzeller's son and daughter, when they grew up, uh, played very important roles in education in Korea. So here's that Peche uh, Akdang as it was when it was being built, and here it is still something of it survives today in that road even from Sosobun into Chongdong. It's been restored and turned into a museum. And a picture also of the Triangle Press building. Now the most famous person probably, the one, the name that everybody knows, Horace Grant Underwood, uh, and, as I say, he arrived also very early uh, in 1885 with Adam Zeller. Actually, Underwood was born in London, in England. His parents then emigrated to the States. And Underwood, too, was particularly concerned to establish modern Western education in Korea. So he founded the Gongjin School, which uh, then he went on to found this Chosun Christian College which is the predecessor of Yonsei. And the Chosun Christian College originally began in the building of the Seoul YMCA in March 1915, which he and James Garth Cale had established in 1900. In 1889, he married Lydia Sterling Horton, who was a missionary doctor, a doctor for women. Notably, she was the doctor for Queen men. In 1915, Underwood became the president of the newly established Chosen Christian College. But then, the next year, he returned to America and died quite young. And the Underwoods lived, in, as all the missionaries did, in Korean style, at least outside. I think the rooms were adapted inside. The other very famous person is Dr. Horace Allen. Dr. Allen in fact, entered Korea in 1884, before the caption uh, coup. Uh, he was a doctor, and he, his position was doctor stationed in the American legation, because at this time, missionaries were not yet admitted to Korea. And in December 1884, when the caption coup uh, erupted during the banquet designed to celebrate the opening of the first postal service, Post office. Um, the nephew of the Queen, Min Young Ik, a very remarkable man, was seriously wounded, nearly killed Western education in Korea. So he founded the Gongjin School, which uh, then he went on to found this Chosun Christian College, which is the predecessor of Yonsei. And the Chosun Christian College originally began in the building of the Seoul YMCA in March 1915. 
which he and James Scott Cale had established in 1900. In 1889, he married Lydia Sterling Horton, who was a missionary doctor, a doctor for women. Notably, she was the doctor for women. In 1915, Underwood became the president of the newly established chosen Christian College. But then, the next year, he returned to America and died quite young. And the Underwoods lived, in, as all the missionary did, in Korean style, at least outside. I think the rooms were adapted inside. The other very famous person is Dr. Horace Allen. Dr. Allen, in fact, entered Korea in 1884 before the caption uh, coup. Uh, he was a doctor, and he, his position was doctor stationed in the American legation because at this time, missionaries were not yet admitted to Korea. And in December 1884, when the Gapshin coup uh, erupted during the banquet designed to celebrate the opening of the first postal service in Korea, the post office, um, the nephew of the Queen, Min Yong Ik, a very remarkable man, was seriously wounded, nearly killed. And it was Alan who, by his medical skill, saved his life. And this made a great impression on the Queen and the King. And this persuaded the King that Western medicine uh, was what Korea needed. In 1885, then, he was allowed by the King, um, encouraged to found the first Western hospital in Korea, Kwang uh, Kyewa. And that was then, in 1886, renamed Jejong Won. And in the same year, that received also a medical school, the first medical school in Korea. But then Alan became interested in diplomatic affairs. In 1887, he accompanied the first Korean legation in Washington. And in 1890, he in fact became secretary. And in 1897, he became US minister and consul general in the American legation in Seoul. He moved from being a missionary to being a diplomat and an important one. That's the hospital. Another very famous name among our founders is Homer Ezalil Holbert, who uh, came to Korea, first of all, in 1886 to teach in this very strange Royal English School, which uh, King Kojum had founded. He felt that the sons of the uh, Yangban, the high officials, ought to know English. So he established the school, and Americans were asked to volunteer as teachers. Uh, the problem was that uh, nobody asked the young aristocrats if they wanted to learn English, and they didn't. Uh, so uh, Holbert became discouraged and went back to America in 1891. That was it. But Athens never wanted to go back. So in 1893, he returned, and Athens never said, well, if you don't want to teach in Patriot, come take charge of the trilingual press. And the press had already begun to print a monthly magazine called Korean Repository uh, the, the previous year. And so Holbert came back essentially to run the press, to publish books, to help publish the repository. Until 1897, when Kojong, who knew him very well and who was obviously very attached to him, appointed him principal of a new royal normal school, which came to be known the Imperial Middle School, which was a school designed to educate uh, teachers for the new Western-style schools that Korea had decided to establish. Later, in 1901, he founded another monthly magazine, the Korea Review, to replace Korean Repository, which had finished publishing. And then, in 1905, he was caught up in the turmoil of the events leading up to the protectorate and the annexation. He was sent by the Emperor to the Hague Peace Conference and uh, failed, uh, as we all know. The Emperor had abdicated while he was still in, in Europe. He returned to Korea briefly, then went back to America for good. And the famous last scene, 1948, he could not attend the actual establishment of the Republic of Korea because his wife was dying. So uh, President Syngman Rhee invited him to come back the following year 
and he did. He came back by boat to Europe and then by train across the Siber Trans-Siberian Express, then by boat to Incha and straight into hospital and died a week later. Not surprising, he was about 87. So, uh, great man. And in his, on his grave, there's the famous inscription, I would rather be buried in Korea than in Westminster Abbey. Well, me too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Korean repository there, yeah, which is a very interesting source of all sorts of information about Korea. And one of the most important contacts that Holbert had in his years in the 1890s was with the Soviet Union, who had gone into exile after the Gatian coup, and then being able to come back, very remarkable Korean, the first Korean to be naturalized American, the first Korean to marry a white American woman, the first Korean to become an American doctor. And of course, uh, he established, uh, Mr. Jason established the independent newspaper in English and in uh, Korean, and the English was in fact for a time edited by Holbert's brother, Korea Review. And then James Garth Gale. James Gale was Canadian in origin. He arrived also in the 1880s, again, involved in the translation of the Bible. Gale was a great scholar. Gale had studied literature uh, in university before coming. Uh, he was immensely interested in Chinese uh, writing and Chinese characters. He was a linguist. He published Korean grammatical forms and he published a Korean translation of Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, the first translation into Korea of the work of Western literature, and then a dictionary. But then, after, as there one reason why the RES altered after its foundation, Gay was often absent uh, in the early 1900s. But then he came back, helped me found the RSVP, and he was president once. 1927, he left Korea and went to Korea Strange. He went to Dublin. Britain, and in a very quiet, not boring town called Bath, where he died. So here you have these translators, these great scholars, both Korean and uh, Western, Reynolds, whom we're not going to talk about, and Underwood in the middle, and Gale. One English uh, missionary, Mark Napier Trollope, seen here as bishop, he came back to Korea as Anglican Bishop. Trollope was born in London, became an Anglican priest in England, and in 1890 arrived in Korea, serving in Seoul. But then his father was sick, so he went back to England in 1902, another reason why the Arias uh, stopped functioning, I think. But in 1911, after the death of the current bishop in Korea, he was chosen to replace him. And late in 1911, just after the RAS had been refounded, he came back. And he was president of the RASKB most of the time from 1970 until his uh, sudden death in 1930. Famous uh, moment that in 1930, coming back from London from the Lambeth Conference, the boat he was on, as it came into Kobe Harbor, collided with another boat that was going out. A lot of excitement, he ran back to his cabin to fetch his life jacket, ran back up onto the deck, and died. It's very dangerous to run when, when you have a bad heart. He knew he had a bad heart. So, uh, Trollope's death was a great blow to the RSKB and to the community of Korea. Another famous person, Oliver Addison, who was also a doctor, who came a little bit later, 1893, he met Horace Underwood in the States. And he became head then of the medical school. And it was Alison who, in 1900, met this rich man who needed severance and persuaded severance to give money for a hospital and medical school in Seoul. And so it was thanks to him that, uh, opposite Seoul Station, the new severance hospital was built. And um, the name was changed only in 1913. Um, and the name of the hospital, I think, was changed first, but then the school also, <coughs> several And he then, after Underwood died, he became president of the Jerusalem Christian College, which the following year was renamed Yanni College. And that year, in 1917, the brother of Underwood, who had made lots of money by investing in the 
manufacturer of typewriters, um, they purchased the land which is now the Yonsei University campus. And he was finally forced out by the Japanese. So the old Severance, or the new old Severance Hospital. Um, among the founders, there is also Scranton, who is also a doctor. Scranton, it's very hard to find a photo of him. He is the man with the hat on the right hand side. In the middle is Appenzeller. On the left is the gentleman called Heron, who is about to die of typhoid. And below him is his wife, who is going to become the wife of James Gale uh, a few years later. In front of Dr. Scranton, on, just on the level below, is his mother, Mrs. Scranton, uh, of whom I will say something in a minute. And in the middle is, you can almost not see him, uh, holding the child is uh, Horace Underwood. So Scranton also established clinics, and um, his mother established a little school for girls, one or two girls, and the school's name was Iwa Akta. She's the founder of Iwa University. So the Scranton Hospital, that is very strong, other. And the hospital for women that she established. All of this in Chongdong. George Keeper Jones, uh, finally, who contributed quite a lot to transactions, which articles are in our new book, uh, was Methodist. And he came, again, translator. He was a great scholar and very interesting. Uh, he was very interested in other religions. He wrote an article, we published an article in the book, uh, his article about Shamanism, and also yeah, about uh, Buddhist statues. So, 1900, the RSKB has been established. Uh, it has meetings, it presents papers sometimes. It's still very small, and history moves on. I uh, say so after about 1903, uh, the people involved, quite a lot of them, go back home or die. And um, the RAS stops functioning while you have the Russo Japanese War and then the Ulsa Treaty in 1905, which creates, which makes Korea protectorate, uh, the, the fiasco, if you like, of the International Peace Conference in The Hague when the Emperor's appeal was rejected and he was forced then in July 1907 to abdicate in favor of his son. And uh, then finally, 22nd of August uh, 1910, uh, the Emperor of Dehan was finally annexed by Japan. So where was the RAS during those vital years when it wasn't functioning? Um, I think Jordan was not interested. Alan Zeller had drowned. Heber Jones went back to the States. James Gale's wife was sick. Homer Holbert was too busy with the um, Korea Review, the war, and Horace G. Underwood uh, was also perhaps not so interested at all. In fact, so there was a hiatus. So here you have the uh, Horace Horton Underwood, the son of Horace Grant, who was to play a vital role after he returned to Korea from studies uh, in the about 1911-1912 through until 1951 when he died. Uh, Horace Horton Underwood was a great scholar, a very dynamic figure. I, say, I listed all these different organizations that he was head of. He was president of the RSKB after Bishop Trollope died for many of the years, including he was president. He was here in Korea uh, when uh, Pearl Harbor was bombed. He was one of the 20 or so foreigners, uh, Westerners, who remained and was interned. Then he came back at the end of the war. It's a very famous tragic incident when his wife was killed in 1949 during uh, an attack on their house uh, by uh, communists. He was in the US when the Korean War started. He immediately returned to Busan, where he died in 51. And it was really Horace H. Underwood with Dr. Allison who started to build the buildings of what is now Yonsei University, Yang He College and Severance Hospital combined to give you Yang Sen. So in 1911, the RAS was revived. And it was revived partly or almost mainly by two people. The first of them, Arthur Hyde Lay, 
Arthur Hagley was the British consul at that time, simply the consul in Incheon, in Chimbulpur. He had also been in Japan. He'd arrived in Japan in 87 and studied Japanese and so worked as an interpreter, but somehow he was attracted to Korea. After that one year at Incheon, in Chimbulpur, he was sent to Hawaii, which he hated, very strange, and uh, then to Japan. And he begged to be allowed to come back to Korea, where he stayed from 1914 until 1927 as Consul General. And he was elected then the first president of the revived RES in 1911. So this year, 2011, made our second birthday, our second centenary. Uh, that he went to Hawaii briefly, but then he came back in 1916, and uh, so he came back in 1915. Gale resigned so that he could become president again. Another of the important figures of that second foundation in 1911 was George Holthorn Skidmore uh, from the American uh, representation. Career diplomat, he first was in Japan again in 1881, and returned to Japan and served in Seoul 1909 1913. He was Consul General during the annexation. Then he went back to Japan and died there. But in 1911, when the RSPB was starting up again, several of the meetings were held in his house at the US Consul General at his invitation, where he lived with his mother, who was also known as Mother Skidmore. And his sister is famous because she was the person who started the campaign to plant cherry trees in Washington, D.C. So on January 23rd, uh, 1911, just a few months after the annexation, the RESKB was reborn at a meeting. But only two of the original founders of the RESKB from 1900 were present, James Gale and William Scranton. And the meeting was held in Scranton Sanitarium. And Arthur Hyde was elected president. And then the first paper was given. And this paper is highly controversial. It was given in the US consulate, and it was given at the invitation of the American Consul General, Skidmore. And it was entitled The Old People and the New Government. And it was given by Midori Komatsu, Japanese, not just any Japanese. He was director of foreign affairs of the government general Chosun. And his paper is a systematic uh, presentation of the Japanese version of relationships between Japan and Korea, explaining why, in fact, Korea and Japan were originally one country and are therefore very happy to be back together again. And the RAS members, there were nine of them present, many guests as well, members of the diplomatic war and ladies, and they proposed a hearty vote of thanks at the end. And then the council met, directed Gail to ask him for a copy of the paper to be published in Transactions. And it was the first paper published in the fourth volume of the Reborn Transactions. And two other papers were given by Japanese speakers that same year. One of them, very cheerful after dinner speech style, about how after the engine wear on, Koreans and Japanese merrily restored friendly relationships at once. And then the other on the coinage of old Korea, and numismatics, uh, by Morihiro Ichihara, who had already at this time earned a PhD in finance from Yale, and was the first governor of the Bank of Chosen. And so these Japanese, these very cultivated, educated, very westernized Japanese, were among the first speakers in the new, the uh, re-established uh, ISKB uh, We did not uh, include their papers in the volume, which I need to see why. And in fact, it's clear that Gale and Lay, at this point in 1911, early 1911, were very well disposed toward the Japanese. Skidmore too. Uh, one of the reasons for this, I think, is the way Korean nationalists had begun to espouse violence, and that alienated much of the sympathy missionaries might have had for their cause, at least some of the 
had the violence included an attack on George Peter Jones, the assassination of Dolomite Stevens in San Francisco in 1908, and of course uh, uh, the uh, assassination of Ito Hirobumi Hiro Hiro by Anton Gum. But after that, uh, no Japanese was ever invited again. Uh, it's clear that uh, the pro-Japanese sort of feelings didn't last, and I've uh, put here fairly rather too long. One of the most important incidents which changed the perception of the Japanese regime at this moment is the case of the 105, uh, which only goes to show uh, how uh, very unskillful uh, the, uh, the Japanese were. Here we are just after the um, annexation, early in 1911. Suddenly the Japanese, for no reason, began to claim there had been an attempt to assassinate the Japanese Governor General, Karojima Matsatake. During a meeting with him and uh, a missionary, uh, George Shannon up in North Korea, late in 1910, they claimed that there was no proof, nobody had ever seen anything, nothing had happened, but they said there was a conspiracy. And after a time when sort of stirring it up, uh, from October in 1911, uh, they began to arrest hundreds of Koreans, including the very famous, later very famous speaker, Kim Go, leaders of political act, uh, action groups. And the most important thing was that these Koreans that they had arrested were almost all of them Christians, Protestants. But uh, we do find uh, that both uh, Arthur Hyde Lay and Gale, <coughs> at the start of this incident, uh, expressed in print sympathy for the Japanese, for the Governor General, uh, very strong criticism of the uh, Korean uh, resistance to Japanese annexation. That was in 1911. But then it took a long time to bring the people to trial. Um, 105 then in 1912 were found guilty. And the leaders of the American churches who had missions in Korea had a meeting with the American president in Washington in 1912 to express their dismay at this persecution of Christians. They saw this as a clear case of persecution. And in fact, of course, there was no case entirely raped, there was no evidence of any kind, and uh, it, it led to a kind of international condemnation. American legal experts condemned the Japanese criminal code, the court system as archaic, barbaric, and uncivilized. The British ambassador to Japan told the Japanese foreign minister that the trial was a travesty of justice. Uh, so, of course, I, I'm sure that uh, they and Gale also uh, revised their opinions. And of course, at the same time, and in the following years, uh, the Japanese did everything they could to lose the sympathy and support of those Westerners who were still in Korea, uh, limiting the right of foreigners to be active in education or in medical work or in business, and making it almost impossible for foreign medical people to practice medicine, and to make it necessary to obtain government permission to open a new church pay church workers until in March 15 the Bible was excluded from school curricula. So uh, I think that there was uh, a moment in 1911, an unfortunate moment perhaps, but uh, after that uh, things uh, did not continue in that direction as I say no Japanese was ever invited back to the ISKB after 1911. So we have these papers the first three volumes before uh, the uh, hiatus. The first two papers published in Transactions are among the most interesting. They are both in the volume. James Gale um, published, Gale and then published this book, uh, The Influence of China Upon Korea. And Gale is convinced and presents case after case after case to say that 
the essence of Korean culture, at least Korean higher culture, and the foundation of Korean nationhood uh, is entirely uh, dependent upon and derives from China. And he uh, is points toward the figure of Fija as being the founding figure of Korean uh, nationhood and Korean identity. Uh, as I say, Gale was fascinated by Chinese. He translated a lot of classical Chinese works, uh, including the poems of Yu Bo. Uh, a lot of his translations have still not been published, but he was a very great scholar. And Gale's history is marked by uh, long quotations of uh, his translations of poetry. But the second paper, given by Homer Holbert, goes in the opposite direction. Homer Holbert had, so I'm sure that actually between Gale and Holbert, uh, there was a very strong tension. And his paper, Holbert's paper, uh, starts with Tango. And Holbert's case is, Gale says Korea is essentially China. And so that's nonsense, because Korea is essentially Korea. It, he says it's essentially different, where Gale seemed to be saying no difference. And there's a discussion which is also published in the volume. It's pretty vicious. They really had a very sharp confrontation. And Heber Jones is vice president, sort of trying to count things down. And it's all reported in, in, the, in the text. It's very remarkable. But after this, we do find that uh, what is published, what is presented to the RSV, is mostly pretty sort of old stuff. Uh, George Heber Jones' first article on this very ancient Ujin statue, this huge Buddha down in the countryside. Most interesting thing in his text is they went there by bicycle from Suwa. They were riding on bicycles, but they only had one pump. And in those days, bicycle tires had to be pumped up very often. And somebody stole the pump. <laughs> Said we learned that we should take two pumps. <laughs> and then uh, Bishop Trollope, my well, father Trollope's first article, a remarkable, extensive history of Kangwa, Kangwa Island down there, um, also full of uh, Chinese characters. Heber Jones on shamanist beliefs, a fascinating image of how, at this point, uh, shamanism was alive in life. Uh, in, in daily life in Korea. And then uh, we did not, we could not uh, reprint everything. Uh, from these early volumes, we chose one other, the culture and preparation of ginseng. So here we have the report of current practice, how at the very start of the 20th century, how ginseng was grown, and it's in great detail, the cultivation, and then the preparation, the drying and packing of ginseng, written also by Collier, who was a missionary, uh, who uh, did not stay so very long. Then, as I say, we uh, started again the first volume of transactions after the uh, interruption, dated 1912-13, uh, with these Japanese papers. So in fact, um, from these, uh, we selected just one, uh, an account of village guilds, how in each village, in many villages in Korea, there were organizations. People were organized so that either sort of voluntary guilds or sometimes compulsory guilds uh, to take care of each other if there was a fire, if there was a disaster. Uh, people were in charge of themselves. Sometimes these guilds uh, were also organized to beat up the um, tax collectors. They were not popular. Uh, a very nice couple of papers which we've included. Uh, Arthur May wrote a description of marriage customs. He describes how at this time, uh, how a marriage was organized, how it was arranged uh, with the, um, what do you call it, the, the comparison of the birth dates of the young man and the young girl, and how you decide which one, uh, if they're okay or not. So they don't meet, they never meet until the wedding. But uh, the dates when they were born are the most important things. 
And uh, James Dale uh, added to that uh, a detailed description of exactly how uh, the Koreans following the traditional Chinese practice um, uh, analyze uh, horoscopes. And there are lots of other articles uh, which we did not include. Uh, Gibbet uh, is a very interesting person. Uh, Gibbet, uh, who wrote about guilds, uh, he came as Secretary General of the YMCA. He'd been born in Britain, came through the States. And he's a very important person because he is the person who first called Koreans to play baseball and play basketball. And the Seoul YMCA was the starting point of Korean baseball. But then there were conflicts, maybe something to do with the case of the 105, and Kiddo uh, went on to spend many years afterwards in Shanghai. And then uh, we have the remaining papers that are published in the volume. Bowman's History of Medicine, remarkable that a doctor, a Western medicine doctor, should to this extent um, study the books which were used by the Oriental doctors. Uh, the books about herbal medicine, Oriental medicine, and um, acupuncture. Although I don't think he really believed any of it. But he has written and is in your book with an extremely detailed account, with full, again, full of Chinese characters. Gale's account of the Pagoda of Seoul, the Pagoda of Seoul is the pagoda that is somewhere just up there in Jongno, uh, in Takwa, uh, Kongma. Uh, hunting and uh, hunter's law. Horace H. Hunter who was a great hunter. He loved killing animals. Uh, but he also observed them, visited them, and described what the animals were that he killed. And Mills was a mining engineer, and he describes in great detail with photographs uh, how gold was being mined in Korea at this time. Finally, then, uh, Bishop Trollope uh, wrote a very lengthy introduction to the study of Buddhism in Korea. Uh, actually, he read books about Buddhism and then tried to relate what he read in the books to uh, what he could see in Korea. And the last one, the last, again, very full of illustrations, Korean coin charms and amulets by Frederick Starr. Frederick Starr is a very interesting person in anthropologist at the University of um, Chicago. He came many times to Japan and quite often to Korea. And um, he's the first person, I think, to actually offer a course in what we would call Korean studies. In 1922 or 23, at the University of Chicago, he offered a course in Korean ethnography. Um, I want to finish with a little sort of rather more anecdote story. Uh, if you've been to the National Museum in Korea, you have seen this, the ten-story pagoda of Gongchonsa, which is in the great lobby of the National Museum. And if you look at the, um, if you look at the notice at the foot of it, it says it was restored from Japan to Korea thanks to the efforts of the journalists Albert and Bethel. Uh, now, Bethel, a uh, fascinating character, uh, we don't have much time, but Bethel was a remarkable Englishman who, after being in Japan, came to Korea and decided that he was pro Korea. And during the um, Russo Japanese War, he sided with the Korean resistance to Japan. And he established, he was first of all here as a correspondent, and his newspaper in London sacked him because he was anti Japanese. And so he, he founded uh, the Korea Daily News, and then he launched a Korean newspaper as well. And the British government is horrible, it's scandalous. The British government was so favorable to Japan that Bethel was tried twice by the British consular court because each nationality was under the law of their country when they lived in Korea. And first of all, he was fined, or he made the fine somehow, and then went on publishing attacks on Japan. So then he was sentenced to three weeks in 
prison in Shanghai, and uh, he came back. <coughs> and again, he went on publishing the Korea Daily News, uh, Robert Head has written all about it. Uh, there are many people are very fascinated by this man. But unfortunately, uh, it seemed maybe the jail experience didn't help. There was a lot of smoking and drinking as well, and finally he died uh, in 1909. But the important thing is that uh, in his newspaper, he published uh, reports of uh, the great scandal. And he was a great figure for the Koreans. They, for, the Koreans loved him and hailed him as one of the great supporters of the independence. But you see, this pagoda, the, the real pagoda, the Gongsan pagoda, uh, was first erected during the colonial period uh, up near um, Kaesong. Beautiful pagoda, white marble, uh, that people often thought was really Chinese, or it wasn't. And then in March 1907, there was no more a monastery there, it's just there in the middle of nature. A group of armed Japanese arrived with commission from this uh, Japanese um, lord, Tanaka Mitsuaki, uh, who claimed that Kojong had authorized him to take the pagoda to Japan. He was minister of the Japanese imperial household, and he came to Korea as the emperor of Japan's representative for the wedding of the crown prince. And so, because they had guns, uh, the pagoda was duly removed. And when news reached Seoul, Bethel was furious, Koreans were furious. Um, he denounced it. Homer, Homer, who was in the States, also wrote articles about it. This is in 1907, 1908. Nothing happened. This is how it was before they took it, standing there alone in the countryside up in you know, near Kaesong. And this is the, the bad guy. And if you read Mackenzie's uh, book, Korea's Fight for Freedom, there's a very lengthy description of this. And he's very upset, he's very, very critical of all of this. I think he's rather sort of ironic, scornful. Oh, the Seoul press made, their, made the best excuse it could. Oh, the Viscount is a conscientious official. Oh, he's an ardent virtuoso collector. Maybe his collector's eagerness got the better of his judgment. But, Mackenzie said, apologies, excuses, regrets, notwithstanding, the Pogoda was not returned. But he was wrong. The Pogoda had been returned in 1918. And, as I said, the National Museum of Korea said it was because of Bethel and Holbert. Ten years after Bethel had died and Holbert had left Korea. Uh, I think uh, at least uh, some credit ought to be given. I'm not quite sure how Korean scholars uh, view this gentleman. Sekiro Tadashi uh, was professor in the architecture department at Tokyo University, the first Japanese art historian to come to Korea, and he began to catalog, list, analyze, describe uh, the Korean antiquities, which officially, from the Japanese point of view, were proto-Japanese, of course. And he, from 1913, began to work on a whole series of wonderful books of photos and description of ancient sites, monuments, arts, art objects, photos and drawings of ancient Korea, objects and sites. And this was published right through. And really, uh, this is the man who established the list which we still follow of the Korean national treasures. And uh, the Government General Museum had been founded. Uh, first of all, the building had been built in 1915 on the site of the Crown Prince's compound in college uh, as part of a chosen product promotion exhibition held in 15 to commemorate the fifth year organization of the museum. And Sekino Tadashi was very influential, and he was the person who said this museum needs to house things like um, sculptures, pagodas, carvings from uh, abandoned palaces and temple ruins. And the building, very splendid building, and of course those of us who were here in the 80s remember it, an uh, impressive uh, building there. And here, a bit later, you can see it has 
some kind of pagoda uh, stuck in front of it. Uh, so the role of the RSTB in this is pretty indirect. You see, James Gale made a study of the tactical pagoda, uh, uh, the long tactical pagoda, which is the center of Seoul. And his article, which is in the book, and this is why I'm saying about it, the article which is in the book uh, is very important because it was Gale who first established uh, the relationship between the, uh, this this pagoda and the older pagoda, which it was made to imitate. And he indicates that the Gyeongchans and the older pagoda have been taken to Japan, that he has no comment to make. And this is the pagoda which still stands protected, so it's invisible, in Takoy Park. But see, in his article, uh, Gale begins the paper precisely with a quotation from Tsukino Tadashi. Its design may be said to be the most perfect attainment of the beautiful. This pagoda may be said to be the far the most wonderful monument in Korea. So if Tsukino Tadashi wrote like that about the older, I'm sure he's writing about the old, original pagoda, surely he was in a position to do everything he could to bring it back from Japan the house in the new museum he was caring for. And that was in 18, 1918. It was dearly returned. But it was damaged. It remained in storage. It was only finally restored and re-erected in the garden outside in 1960. Then, a few years later, damaged by modern acid rain, it was removed until today. It's safely housed inside the National Museum. This is what it used to look like. And this is what it looks like now. Oh, too long. Thank you very much.